Okay, it's time to begin. I do not see Tioni nor Amelia. Otherwise, we're good to go. We are today going to be focusing on the death of massive stars, learning about white dwarf or not white dwarfs, but um, neutron stars and black holes. Here you go, Tioni. So start off with this picture we ended with last class period. A very massive star has so much gravity that it is going to, you know, when the core runs out of fuel, it's just going to compact it more until you reach a high enough temperature to fuse the next fuel. And so it's going to fuse everything that's possible. And of course, just like with hydrogen, when the core runs out of that material, the core shrinks more, it gets hotter outside, and you start a shell going out. So in the death stage of a very massive star, and now you might ask, what mass is a very massive star? Well, this would be for stars that are greater than about eight solar masses. So for these stars that are more than eight solar masses, you're going to have all of these things, hydrogen, helium, carbon, neon, oxygen, silicon, all having a shell of fusion that's burning out with question. What's the death of like 150 masses? Um, they don't form stars more than 150 masses, set, so they don't have a death. No, you said more than 150. 150 is the limit. Stars greater than 150 solar masses, at least in theory, can't form. Okay, I, I don't understand the question then. Okay, so what's going to happen to the biggest stars? We'll get through that today. I, yeah, I didn't understand the question. So they're going to stop at fusing silicon into iron. So when it shows iron, the iron here is the core. And the core is iron because iron won't fuse and release energy. You have to put energy in to fuse with iron. So that's the end of the line. That's why the core ends up iron here. And I showed you this for brief seconds at the end of class. Just to get the times is what I focused on at the end of class. For a 25 solar mass star, how long it is in each stage. Notice over here now, the primary fusion products. This is showing the fusion relations. So for hydrogen fusion, we've learned two mechanisms for hydrogen fusion. What mechanism is going to be occurring in a large star, like a 25 solar mass star? I don't know about you guys, but I tend to be visual in my memory. It had a picture like this, had an atom here with the hydrogen coming in, atom here, here. So you mean the same? Yes. Same. Whoops. It was C N C N. I think it went something like that because you had the decays occurring in between and hydrogens coming in along the way. So you had a total of four hydrogens coming in and it was producing helium in the end. So that's what's going on in the large stars. If it was a smaller star like our sun, what's going on in the core? What, what do we call that one? The triple alpha. No, the triple alpha is actually this one. But the fusion of hydrogen to helium, how does that occur in our sun? Wait, what did the large stars get to like the initial carbon nitrogen and oxygen from? Um, those, they don't have to have much. And they're going to be produced along with some of this lower fusion. You're just going to have a few events for creating the larger ones. Um, we'll learn about, I say later, we only have one week. We'll learn about population one, population two stars. You can also have a star that formed from gas, a cloud that had other stars that died and contributed gas to it and that can also be okay our sun what do we call the method of fusion going on in the core of our sun right now the proton proton chain so i'm going to write this in up here not proton proton chain
because it has more mass and it can go to the slightly more efficient CNO cycle. Okay, then the, the helium fusion is the triple alpha process. That's the same process that will occur in our sun when it undergoes helium fusion. And so you have three helium nuclei that come together all at once to give you the carbon. Notice the temperatures, 100 million kelvins is necessary to fuse helium. Very high temperature. Then our star is going to stop there. The sun's going to stop there. But a massive star will then fuse carbon. And notice it's carbon and helium being fused now. So you tend to think, oh, he said the helium is done because it's out of fuel. Where did this helium come from? Right? Is that a good thought? Is it reasonable? The, the answer is, when I say it runs out of fuel, it's not dry. In fact, it probably still has more hydrogen than anything else. But it doesn't have a high enough proportion for the fusion reaction to occur efficiently. And so there's still going to be a lot of helium. It's just there's not a high enough proportion of helium for you to have a, an efficient helium fusion. And so it compresses and then you get helium fused with carbon to produce oxygen. And then going further, I'll bet you it's finally up to the yep. Going further, you have carbon and carbon fusion to produce neon plus helium. Hey, more helium coming into the play. Then the next step, neon and neon producing magnesium and oxygen. So we had oxygen produced here. We have oxygen produced here. And then we combine oxygen, oxygen producing silicon and more helium. And finally, the last step is silicon and silicon producing iron. So it, it's kind of interesting to me just to look at these. They're not, you know, you tend to think it's just building blocks and I've got this and I add one more and I have the next, but it's a little more complicated. You can also consider the amount of energy, 71% of the energy that the 25 solar mass star releases over its lifetime comes from the fusion of hydrogen. And it's just small amounts. You know, these are all small numbers for the balance. Oh, and the temperatures, yes, they keep ramping up. So that's 1.5 billion is necessary to fuse neon. 2.5 billion kelvins is necessary to fuse silicon. High temperatures, right? It's, I don't say you have to have those memorized necessarily, but know that they're continuing up and you're getting into the billions by the time a massive star has finished fusing everything. <sighs> so what happens? The high mass stars, as they're dying, they'll produce elements as large as iron. And so if we look at the, the elements that make up the Earth, we have hydrogen, right? Our water is very rich in hydrogen. We have some helium, but the Earth can't hold on to hydrogen or helium in the atmosphere. They're lost. Why do we not have the ability to hold on to hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere? It does take more velocity. Yeah, the escape velocity that is about 11.2 kilometers per second on the surface of the Earth. Hydrogen and helium, they will have a, a speed at air temperature that has a significant fraction of them going faster than that speed. So they have enough energy that they can escape. Of course, they're going to have collisions as they go up, but they have enough energy they can escape. And so we simply can't hold on to hydrogen and helium gases. We can hold on to hydrogen and water. So, but, you know, as soon as it gets separated from the oxygen, we can hold on to oxygen, but not to hydrogen. How is it then that we have hydrogen and helium at all? That, that is part of it. That's part of it. But there is another part. Our, we're producing hydrogen and helium. How are we producing hydrogen and helium? From radioactive decay of elements that are larger than iron. Things like uranium is a naturally occurring rock that's radioactive. And it's producing hydrogen, well, it's producing mostly helium. 
as it decays to lead. And so we have a continual production of helium as the uranium decays on its way toward lead. So, and there are other radioactive elements that produce hydrogen. So we have these gases being replaced by radioactive decays. So elements like iron, right? We look at the things the crust is made of. It was primarily iron, silicon, and oxygen. Where do those elements come from? Those are made during the death of stars. So that means using the scientific theory, right? Not taking a, um, ad nihilos, what, what is the word, gentlemen? Ad nihilos, what's the word for nothing in Greek? Or is it, or is it Latin? I don't know, that's Latin. Ad nihilo, I think it's nihilo. Anyway, may, it, assuming that we're going to take the scientific approach of saying that the earth was formed naturally, that it was not just created out of nothing by God, right? Because if it was created out of nothing by God, that could happen. Science isn't ever going to explain it, because science, by its definition, relies on things being natural, not on things being supernatural, such as having God. So if we're going to try to explain the formation of the earth by a scientific method rather than, you know, a, a caveat, then that means that there had to have been plenty of silicon and oxygen and iron in the solar nebula. But if there's plenty of silicon and oxygen and iron in the solar nebula, and silicon and oxygen and iron are only formed in the death of massive stars, stars that are more than eight solar masses, then that means that there must have been larger stars in the vicinity of where our sun formed that had died and contributed these elements. And so you can look around and say, everything around you that's not hydrogen or helium, that's stardust. That's material that was, the atoms themselves were formed in a star while it was dying. And then those atoms that were created as the star that was dying became part of the Earth when the Earth formed. So, you know, the whole song, why do you, it, it talks about, Spring of stardust in your hair. Well, we, I could just drop some dirt in your hair and that's sprinkling stardust in your hair. It's not nearly as romantic as the song tries to make it sound. Here's, once again, we looked at this picture. I, I fast forwarded to it last class period that shows the binding energy per nucleon and that iron here is at the top. Well, you know what happens when the pin stops working. At least I figured this out. Instead of everything, oh, that was the wrong button. Instead of everything going to pot, I know I can kill this and restart it and everything will work again. So iron is the most stable nucleus, and that's why, hey, look, it even remembered my pin strokes that you didn't see. That's why the iron is the end stage for the fusion. And when I talked about the radioactive decay, uranium gives off energy going this way, moving toward lead because it's going toward a more stable nucleus, a higher binding energy per nucleon. So you pretty much have come to the end when you fused silicon into iron. You no longer have any fuel, so to speak. You can't do any fusion reaction and get out energy. It's going to require energy to fuse anything more. But you still have gravity, and gravity is still compressing. All along, we've talked about that hydrostatic equilibrium between the outward forces produced by the explosions and the inward forces due to gravity. Well, now you've run out of anything that can push out. And so it starts crushing until you reach a high enough pressure in the core of a star that at this point, it's not going to be 8 to 20 solar masses anymore. It's going to be... Um, somewhere around one to two solar masses because the stars give off more than half of their mass, as much as maybe they give off nine-tenths of their mass when they're going through these giant stages. But you have enough mass to actually crush the iron together with electrons and essentially undo the entire fusion process. All of the energy that's been produced by fusion is essentially 
not the same energy. But that amount of energy is essentially absorbed back into these iron nuclei, and it converts everything into neutrons. It's complicated. It's easy to pretend that you just made an electron and a proton smash together to make a neutron. It's not the truth, though. It's more complicated than that. But the net result is that. The net result is you smash an electron and proton together and makes a neutron. And you take all of these iron nuclei, smash electrons into them, and all of the protons convert to neutrons, and you end up with one giant nucleus made up entirely of neutrons. So they call it a neutron star because it's all neutrons. <coughs> and so it took a lot of energy to do that crushing. So it sucks all of the energy out, and you suddenly have this core that pulled a lot of energy out. Everything's falling and comes in, hits the core, which of course is going to heat right back up again, and then bounces off, and you have an enormous explosion from the stuff falling in and then being shot back off, and there's a huge neutrino shower produced by the conversion process of making all of those neutrons. And so you have a huge outflow of energy, which we call a supernova. So that's the process that's going on inside the star during the supernova. And this is what the light looks like for different kinds of supernovae. Now remember I said a type 1A supernova was very repeatable. Pretty much always looks the same because you always have the same elements and the same mass. Well, when you have a type 2 supernova, which is what I've been talking about here, you can have different gas um, concentrations, you know, different ratios of gases. You can have different masses. So you have different looking light curves. But those supernovae are massive stars dying. How massive? A good question. Glad, glad I asked it. Basic numbers, we're going to have a clear question in just a moment to ask you all about these. Basic numbers, what's the lowest mass star you can have? Anybody remember? Okay, 0 0.08 solar masses is the lowest mass. Remember, we did have 0 0.016 solar masses with that little question mark. You know, the brown dwarves, are they stars? Are they not stars? 0.08 is generally considered, okay, that's definitely a star. What mass do you have to have for a, um, for a giant to occur? To make a red giant. I should put red there. Everybody remember? Below this mass, you have hydrogen, you have degeneracy when it's still fusing hydrogen, it stops the hydrogen fusion and it's done. What'd you say? Yep, 0 0.5. So that's the lowest mass to form a red giant. What about to form a planetary nebula? You might recall I said there is debate about if our sun will form a planetary nebula. What does that tell you? So it's like yeah, it's like one solar mass. We're right on the boundary where they say may or may not. Okay. Now we go up and let's go with the. Uh, what happened to the alpha planets? Some forms of planetary nebula. What happens? What? What happens to the other planets when the sun forms a planetary nebula? Um, it depends on how close it is to the sun. Like you know, like if Jupiter, Jupiter's going to lose a lot of atmosphere because you'll have all of the pressure pushing the gas away. Beyond that, I don't know. Um, they're so far away, they'll probably, they'll be warmed up some, but not a huge change. It is thought that maybe some of those moons out there, you know, like some of the larger moons, um, Titan, or maybe, you know, Europa, the, the Galileans, they might become actually, well, not Io, 
um, habitable for life because of the increased temperatures. So as the sun ages, if civilization, if Christ hasn't come, you know, if civilization wants to continue, they're going to have to migrate out to some of these moons is a theory. Or, just make war, or what? Or just make war, yes. Okay. So my next question was helium flash. Helium flash starts at this level. Where does it end? That's right. Now, getting into the new stuff. Um, white dwarves, everything down to the white dwarf slash neutron star divide, dividing line is equal to eight solar masses. So everything that's above here, from here to here, will form a white dwarf when it's dead. And more than eight solar masses, it will form a neutron star. Now, there has to be an upper limit for neutron stars. We haven't gotten there yet. And you'll find, I looked this up before class, I'm pretty sure our textbook... Our textbook puts the divider at 20 solar masses, I believe. I saw another site that said traditionally it was believed there was 25 solar masses. Wikipedia says 30 solar masses. Recent research suggests that maybe even 40 solar masses. What does that tell you? We don't really know what the upper, upper limit of the mass is for a star that's going to form a neutron star. Well, it's somewhere between mass. 20 to 40 solar masses. But 51 would definitely form a black hole. But 51 should definitely form a black hole. That's right. So we have those. Now, these are star masses, keep in mind. Not the masses of the object, the death stages. And so we have these here are neutron stars. And then we have an upper limit for any star of 150 solar masses. So that basically tells you what's going to happen to a star based on its mass, how it's going to die. Now, we haven't talked about the black hole yet. We haven't actually talked about the neutron star, but it's good to have these limits. Any questions about these limits? Got them totally memorized? You, you pull up the uh, the PDF so you can <laughs> – no, you, you won't have this in your – well, actually, watch. Check this out. Boom. If you reload the PDF now, you'll have those numbers. <laughs> okay. So in the supernova, you created in the core a neutron star. You convert all the ion into neutrons. All the protons turn into neutrons. But – in the explosion, it's just so massive in energy, it just forms all kinds of atoms to merge together, even though it's energetically non-favorable. That is, it takes energy, it costs energy to make something larger than iron. But during the supernova, there's so much energy, you have very high energy collisions, and that's where every element on that periodic table that is above iron. So if you look at the periodic table, iron is the center of that fourth row. Right, you see iron, cobalt, nickel. Iron, cobalt, nickel, those are things that can be made by fusion. Everything beyond that, so going, you know, copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, going down, you know, rubidium, silver, AG is silver. Below it, AU is gold. You know, all of those things are formed in a supernova. So the fact that we have those in our Earth, once again, tells us that we must be the result of something had a supernova, gases from that supernova then were in the molecular cloud that our solar system was made from. Now looking at other types of supernovae. 
<laughs> At one point I had this so it all fit on the page. Obviously it doesn't anymore. So type 1A supernovae, we already talked about. The type 1A supernova is a white dwarf that collapses. The type 2 supernova is a star somewhere in the range of 10 to 30 solar masses from what we just saw, you know, 8 to 20. 8 to 20 is what's going to be on the, uh, the quicker question. It will then have a type 2 supernova. If it's more than 20, until recently, all I heard was it was still a supernova, but now there's a new name that we'll learn, hypernova. There are other kinds of supernovae, um, type 1b and type 1c. Um, those are, are supernovae that form from the collapse of a star like a type 2 supernova, but you're low in hydrogen for a few different reasons. And so because you're low in hydrogen, it behaves differently. Anybody recognize this picture? Yes. It's the Crab Nebula. I don't see how it looks like I don't either, but that's beside the point. Maybe you like turn maybe you like look sideways at it. I know that did nothing for you. I thought it was funny. Um, the Crab Nebula was tied to supernovae because Chinese astronomers had observed a guest star around 1056 AD. And then when, with the advent of telescopes, people turned their telescopes over to where the Chinese astronomers had said it was right here, and they found the Crab Nebula. And then they said, well, maybe these two are related. Using Doppler shifts, you can measure how quickly the gas is moving. And they found a neutron star in the middle of that. And so it matches all of the theory on what happens when you have a supernova. So now, and if you take the rate of expansion and you extrapolate backward, it extrapolates to the right time for it to have blown up. So scientists take this as pretty good evidence that the theory is correct. You know, you, you can't make a supernova occur in the laboratory. All you can do is make a, a theory about what should happen, make models, and then look to see if you can find evidence that matches the predictions. Ah. Oh. Here is the actual process, star. <laughs> I know, it's really exciting. The outer layers fall in, onto the core, and they bounce off, boom, you have a big explosion, and you're left with the white door, or the neutron star. Got it? Simple, simple diagram. Scientists have noticed that there are these very high energetic bursts of gamma rays. And in studying those, Scientists, you know, found that they're not associated with any identifiable object. They're like, what in the world could be causing these things? And what they finally come to conclude is these bursts of gamma rays are the death of supermassive stars. Stars that are over, you know, that 20 to 40 range, solar masses when they finally die. So when these supermassive stars, because they have so much mass, there's a lot more gravitational energy, hence more energy produced in the explosion. And so that's why it's gamma rays, because gamma rays are shorter wavelength, that means higher energy for the output. So here's a picture showing what happens with a, a hypernova. How does this look different than the last one? Well, this is different. The classy material having those jets. And this is different. What would happen if the jet, when those jets hit something? Um, it would tear apart. Cook it and tear it apart. It'd be bad. Bad. So let's go through some questions. Actually, it's not the first question that has those numbers, but there are three in a row that have the, well, two, two of the three in a row have those numbers. What's the distinction between a type 2 supernova and a hypernova? And notice this is all based on what it leaves behind. So I'll actually underline the important words. White dwarf and neutron star. Neutron star or white dwarf. Neutron star and black hole. Or white dwarf and black hole.
if this such a thing as a block code, is there such a thing as a void hook? In theory, if you make a Einstein Rosen, uh, got the last word, Would it be a, a wormhole, um, that one of the black holes would be called a white hole. Yeah, it's, it's a, I, Einstein Rosen Bridge, that's what it's called. The Einstein Rosen Bridge has a black hole on one side and what they call a white hole on the other. Jessica and Altwin. Oh, Lord, I thought I pressed something. Oh, it's coming on the right channel. Probably have a little Okay, <laughs> this display is all kinds of problematic. There is a two, there is a one. I'm not sure which one is seven, but I think it's this one is seven. And the other one must be zero. Well, no, there's, it's gotta be two. Doing common, math, common core math there tells me. Okay, anybody know who the last person is? Lord, is it I? It's Hannah. Okay. I want to make sure. I couldn't remember what the hypernova leaves behind. So I picked A, but I'm thinking of this. Okay. Why are you thinking it's wrong? Because the majority. Because, <laughs> because of the popularity. Okay. Talk to Russell. Russell, can you help her out? C. Okay. Russell says C. Why did you, why did you tell her C? This slide that said leave behind something. <laughs> Because what? That's why I said he is behind the back hole. Can anybody understand? He said to the slide, said it left behind the black hole. Because it's the slide before. Oh, because the slide before said it leaves behind a black hole. Okay, so he was just you just told me, and so I answered what you just told me. <laughs> well, and that's pretty good reasoning. The hypernova. It's only different in the supernova in that it's more mass and thus leaves behind the more massive remnant of the black hole. So that's why up until recently, I just understood them to both be called they the both, same thing. They both leave behind those giant nebula, right? um, Yes, they'll both leave behind a giant nebula. Although the, the, with the black hole, that's the only thing you see about it is the gas that didn't make it in. Yeah. So since this is kind of a sidetrack theoretical question, but so if black holes are so massive that light gets sucked in and can't escape, if a person got sucked into a black hole before they died, would they theoretically be able to see the black hole? Because like inside the black hole, there's light, right? It's just we don't see it from outside because they can't escape. One of the things about black holes is we can't really say what would happen theoretically inside because we don't understand any physics that could operate inside. Okay. Um, but we can talk about what would happen. Um, some interesting things. The whole idea of time dilation. You know, a lot of people know that if you travel really fast, the rate of time that you measure is not the same as the rate of time of the person who stays still. So if you've read that epic book, Ender's Game, written by a movie, which is as epic, I'm still putting it. Written by a person with a degree in physics. Um, one of the things that it has in it is people in spaceships that are traveling really fast. And because those spaceships are traveling really fast with respect to Earth, the aging of people in the spaceships is very, very slow as measured by people on Earth. That's why you use a hyperjump. Now, the convex, converse of that is the people in those spaceships would see the people on Earth aging very slowly. But um, so you have this time passes at different speeds depending on or different rates depending on your speeds. Well, it turns out that mass does the same thing. Einstein in 1905 had his theory of special relativity, which is the easy relativity. Somewhere around 1960 to then 1918, he came out with this theory of general relativity, which says that mass just warps the space-time continuum. And what that means is mass actually changes the shape of space. It curves it, and it changes the rate at which time passes. So that for a person falling into a black hole, as they're falling in, they say, oh, yeah, the clock's ticking and I'm falling in and whoop, I got in. Somebody that's on Earth and watching them 
would see that it takes them forever and they never make it in because of the difference in the rate of time passing, which is really bizarre. So if a person were to fall in, and I will answer your question, I just want to finish this thought. If, the yes. speed is different, so if you're going in sideways, you right here, and on the other side of you just going at a different speed, so you'll get torn apart. Yeah, that's that's the next thing. If you're getting pulled into a black hole, we've talked about tidal forces, the thing that makes the Earth have high tides and low tides for the oceans, and it flexes things like Io. Io is volcanic because of the tidal forces flexing it. Well, that's just Jupiter causing Io, right? That's just the moon causing the tides on Earth. If you're coming into a black hole, the tidal force, that is the force of gravity between your feet and your head, one square or cubic centimeter of toe is going to be pulled so much harder than one cubic centimeter of skull because it's closer if you're going in feet first like any smart person would go. Well, that it's going to stretch you. So you would be stretched to be miles long if you're falling into a black hole. Would the same thing happen with the sun to a lesser degree? I got two questions. Is that the most big application? Yes, that's right. You said? Would the same thing happen with the sun? No, the, the sun's not enough mass, I don't think, to cause that. Okay, if you went to a bigger star. If you went to a bigger star, at some point, you would reach the point where that would happen. Besides the sun, you get burned up. And a second thing is, because of all of that stretching, it heats you up. And so you'd be millions of Kelvins. So a bottom line on this is you wouldn't survive, right? I mean, I love watching Stargate. I love sliders. Heck, I even like that, was it, Contact, the one with Jenny Foster. But none of that's ever going to be possible. You can't go through a wormhole because, oh, yeah, what was the most recent one? Gra no, it was gravity. Interstellar. Okay, I hate it down there. But, um, <laughs> no, they did. Stargate they didn't go through a wormhole. They made Yes, they, they did. did. They did hyperspace, which is different. No, like a wormhole. For the hence, hence the spin-off show on Stargate of Wormhole Extreme. <laughs> I watched way too much Stargate. Um, oh, you're talking, oh, you're talking about the games themselves? No, there there was a guy who they rescued somewhere. No, I know, they, I know the Wormhole Extreme, okay. extreme but, but you're talking about like the Stargates themselves, not talking about the ships. Yes, the Stargates are supposed to be making essentially a wormhole, which is connecting to black holes. That's why they You're take talking literally about the ways that created humans and like planets. Yes. So Let, let's just go along with science instead of science fiction for the moment. Okay, so we've got to settle what happens if you fall into a black hole. That was certainly not part of the original lecture. Jocelyn Bell, back in 1967. How old was I in 1967? I was zero until the last month of it. So basically when I was a... Your birthday's in December? November. November. So the second to last month. Yes. But the last month is the month that I was one. If you want to be really technical for six weeks. Okay. So she was doing some research and she was looking out in space and she found that signal you see on the left. When you have a repeating, I think that's the actual one she found. You have a repeating spiky signal. You guys have heard maybe of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You mean the people that sit all day next to the giant telescopes? They don't sit all day next to them. They just feed the data into the computer. The well, computer I mean, there's, along there's someone there sitting all day next to them. They are looking for signals like this. Signals that look like they might have been produced by some intelligent being. And so she found this. She's like, what in the world? Now... Did they believe it was extraterrestrial? I don't think they did. But they did at least jokingly call this the LGM signal. LGM standing for little green men. Because, you know, in sci-fi they have the aliens are little green men. But they found this, sim this signal and they're like wondering what in the world caused it. So they start looking around they found lots of them. So this one here, you have somewhere in the ballpark of 10 per second. Hertz is cycles per second. This one here is more along the lines of you know, 1.5 Hertz. Some of these are found with frequencies that are more than a thousand Hertz, a thousand flashes per second, if you will. And so they're like, what in the world could cause these? 
And they're, they're very periodic. You know, you can keep your watch by them. And so scientists start trying to settle what could these be. And so you have a couple options. Like, could it be a variable star? Right, we've learned about the variable stars. Variable stars are getting bigger and smaller, right? Could you have a, car, a star getting bigger and smaller, you know, 10 times a second or 1,000 times a second? Does it seem reasonable? No, no, it's not reasonable. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you can actually determine the maximum size for something like this because if I have a star, the time for it to flash has to be less than the time that it takes for light to go from one side of the star to the other. And so the time for light to go from one side to the other is going to be time is equal to the distance over the speed, so 2 radius over the speed of light. Speed of light, we have the symbol C. And so you can determine right away that the radius of an object producing this has to be less than the number you get from that, the time between flashes, what we actually call the period, so I use it to use capital T. So you can determine what the maximum radius is. That calculation, when you say, okay, we've got one with a period of one one thousandth of a second, well, you take one one thousandth of a second times three times ten to the eight meters per second, well, that's going to be 1.5 times 2 to the 8 meters divided by 2. That gives you, you know, the, the minimum radius or maximum radius you have. Well, the calculations show that this would have to be something smaller than a star. And so, well, that can't be it. So what next? Well, smaller things, it's not reasonable to expect something to oscillate anyway. So maybe we have something small that's rotating. Now it still has, you know, this tells us still about the size. It's not going to change on that. And so what small things do we have? We have, theoretically, the white dwarf and the neutron star. Well, it turns out that with the high frequencies of these, if you had a white dwarf and you spun it on its axis at that frequency, it would be torn apart because inertia would make things fly off of it. So it couldn't be a white dwarf because the nurse or gravity wouldn't be able to hold it together. And so the only theoretical object that was small enough and could withstand the rotation was a neutron star. And so the conclusion scientists came to was that this little green men signal was a neutron star somehow giving off light. Okay, you, somebody over here had a question. I thought it was one of the three gentlemen on the aisle. I could don't remember which. I just thought I saw a hand. So here is the theory that it's kind of like you're looking at a lighthouse. You have a beam of light from a neutron star and it's going around like this. When that beam points at you, you see the flash. What makes it then? The theory is that you have a really, really strong magnetic field. And that really strong magnetic field, as it rotates, it, ca it, it causes um, oh, and synchrotron radiation as it goes, as it passes through um, matter. And that synchrotron radiation then is what is actually coming off of these. So the beam that looks kind of like a lighthouse is synchrotron radiation coming from a very rapidly rotating neutron star with a very, very strong magnetic field. Why would it have a strong magnetic field? Because as it collapsed, the magnetic material all got crushed into a small region spinning super, super fast. Question. Excuse me? Synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron. What is that? Oh, um, synchrotron radiation is radiation produced by... Um, rapidly accelerating charged particles. Okay, to the next one. So here are some pictures just to look at what you see. Now this is with a radio telescope, I believe. 
And you can see the arrow pointing to this object right here, and you can barely see it. You can barely see it inside of that circle, but here it's brighter, very bright here. It's as bright as its companion, then it's fading away. Really can't see it at all there. Can't see it at all here. Can kind of see something there. And there's back again. So that's what they're looking at for their signals. And this is actually from the Crab Nebula. This is the pulsar in the Crab Nebula that they discovered there. So it's not just a neutron star, it's a pulsar. What's a pulsar? It's a rapidly rotating neutron star that, okay, that as it comes around, its beam of light hits us. If the beam of light doesn't hit us, we just say, oh, that's a neutron star because we don't see the beam. Okay. Next clicker question. Why does a pulsar's period decrease over time? I didn't talk about this, so this is asking you to, to think ahead. All right, we had zero, five, seven, zero. Okay, I'm going to use Latifah as my example. Okay, so I'm going to take her out in the middle of the aisle. Okay, keep your feet from touching that. Just so so you won't slow yourself down. Okay, so I spin her around. What's going to happen to her rate of rotation here? What's she doing? She's slowing down. The same thing that happens according to the question. That's action. Okay, so there was friction that was slowing her down. But the space that doesn't. Okay, so there's no friction in space, but it's sending out a beam of light. It's sending out energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed. It has to come from somewhere. The energy that's being emitted with that beam of light is being taken away from its rotation. And so just like Latifah, who is losing energy to friction, it's going to lose energy because of its radiation. Yes? So like, if you send a spaceship into space, and you like to go up the influence of gravity, like once it got to a speed, once you turn off the engines, wouldn't you just keep on going that speed? You would keep going that speed except for you hit a molecule here, a molecule there, and over time it will slow you down. Nothing like the rate it would slow you down in our atmosphere, but it would over a very large distance slow you down. Over a long period of time. Hmm? Over, a long period of time. over a long period of time, yes. Okay, so it loses energy because of the beams. And so here's a picture that's showing rotational rays as a function of time. It's losing energy, so the rotation rate is slowing down. But it has little glitches where it speeds up. Now, I didn't have Latifa do this, but I had Alvin do this a while back. How did he increase his speed when he was rotating? Tuck in. By tucking in. So if I have something out there that's just spinning by itself, what's the only way it can speed up? It has to have the radius get smaller. And notice it happens in pieces. So the theory is that you have this neutron star that over time is it's also cooling. And because it's cooling, things contract when they're cool. And you have a, maybe a hard crust. I say maybe. We'll show a picture in a minute. But that hard crust, it gets to where it's shrunk inside, and it collapses, and suddenly has a, a shrinkage. And it spins up. And so you have those glitches because it's shrunk a little bit. So here's a picture of what we believe a neutron star should look like. Inside we have... A neutron superfluid, it's about 10 kilometers in radius, about six miles, or as I like to say, it basically is about the size of Lincoln on the map. But it's got a mass between 1.1 and 3 solar masses. This 3 solar masses is a theoretical number. The highest that's actually been observed is 2.1 solar masses. 
Notice the 1.1 solar masses. How does that compare to the mass of a white dwarf? It's a lot more. White dwarfs can go all the way up to 1.4 solar masses. So you can have a neutron star that's less massive than a white dwarf. How does that happen? Well, it had to have enough mass to crush it. And then along the process of crushing it, it lost mass. You know, it was it ejected because of the energy released. But the neutron star is still a lot more dense. The what? The neutron star is a lot more dense. Yes. The neutron star is very, very dense. I'm out of time. I, let me, I don't have it here, but let me just point out, we didn't even get to the question with all the numbers. The masses to make a neutron star were between 8 and 20 solar masses, but the masses of neutron stars are 1.1 to 3 solar masses. How is it that a, a 20 solar mass star makes a 3 solar mass neutron star? So much material gets blown off during the death. Okay, have a swell weekend.